Good afternoon and welcome to today's summit, or today's webinar for the National Puerto Rican uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are actually um, live and we're recording. I just want to stress that today's uh, webinar is Embracing DEIJ for Infrastructure and Economic and Community Development. And we are joined by Glenn Vickers. So we're just gonna give it a minute, Glenn, while we start allowing people into the room. Not a problem. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us uh, as we embrace DEIJ for infrastructure and economic for e economic and community development. You've joined uh, today's first part of five series of the webinar and we are joined with uh, Glenn Vickers of um, Managing Director and Founder of MRV Group. We are going to be turning over the webinar to Glenn. I just want to briefly introduce myself. I'm a licensed real estate broker here in Puerto Rico. I'm a transaction advisor with Jones Lang LaSalle, and I'm also the president and founder of Profolio, which is a consulting firm that helps um, small companies, small businesses to expand in Puerto Rico and beyond, as well as Amavi Stays, which is actually a hospitality brand here in uh, Puerto Rico, which we manage Airbnbs and short-term uh, short rental properties for our investors. So it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you today. We are having, I am personally having some technical difficulties with the camera, but fortunately we are uh, live. You can hear our audio and Glenn is able to share his screen. So. We want to thank everybody for joining us, and we look forward to your question and answers before the end of the webinar. Glenn, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to do my uh, screen share right now. And again, if you have any questions, um, please uh, put them on the chat. Yes, to make it easier on you, I will go ahead and facilitate and manage the chat. If there's any questions, uh, we will wait till the end of your presentation to go ahead and, and uh, answer those. Thanks, Glenn. No problem, perfect. So this conversation for today um, is, is dear and near to uh, my heart because really this is the foundation of the work uh, that we do at MRV Group and I'll go more into what we do in a moment. Um, this will be predominantly focused on the business development of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice work um, as it impacts several different industries. Um, today's uh, agenda, um, this is going to be an abstract overview, and then as we go into other parts of the series, we'll drill down into um, further topics um, for everyone who's on the call. But for today, we'll go into introductions. Um, we'll speak about the word lens and how does that impact uh, the work that we do in, uh, within DEIJ. Um, we're going to review and go over key terms. We're going to go over also some DEIJ policies um, throughout the territory 
that will be beneficial for things taking place in the near future and things available now. We'll also refer to uh, government implementation of DEIJ as well as corporate in a very brief assessment about where you are today. So all in all, MRV Group um, is a privately owned uh, diversity supplier and development firm. Uh, and we work uh, within a number of different industries um, within a product line as well as professional services. And that will range between government, construction, energy, transportation, healthcare, education, and manufacturing. Um, you'll learn more about these terms in a moment, uh, but MRV, we are a certified um, MWBE firm, which means Minority Woman Business Enterprise, um, by a number of third-party agencies. And we are also NMSDC, which is National Minority Supplier Development Council as well. And then lastly, we are HUD Section 3, and, and we'll get into that in a moment um, for today's conversation. Uh, but again, whole and all, um, we do our supply chain solutions. We work with manufacturers to be able to meet government set-aside programs. And then when it comes to our professional services, it can range between workforce development, commercial development, uh, and community development work. So again, today's conversation, as we pertain to DEIJ, uh, we're going to go into really the uh, three to four circles um, that we use to define um, people's perspective and where they're coming from. So number one, we go with the first circle. For us, it's the life experiences. So these are direct life experiences as they impact you. And this is an important framework uh, because as we go into um, drilling down to these different business development um, attributes. We want to be able to wear a lens for the different populations that we are working with then. Um, so life experiences can range from your household experience. It can range from number of people in your home. It can range from did you grow up in a in a urban, rural, suburban market. Um, so again, this is one lens that we like to wear. Um, the second lens, uh, second circle would be more of our social factors that influence our life experiences. And those can range between racial, ethnic identi identity, sexual orientation, ancestry, age, education, social class, uh, gender identity, religion, spirituality, length of time in the community uh, is a big one that doesn't get spoken about often, uh, geographic location, place of origin, income, immigration status, marital status, language, and other factors. Um, so again, as we talk about business development and we refer to um, these different programs that are in place for businesses to participate in, these are all the lenses that we want to make sure that folks are, are very privy to and they're aware based upon the work they're actually conducting. So this is the second lens or second circle. The third, as it pertains to your culture, would be your third circle, organizational factors that may add a layer um, of your experience in the workplace. So many of these programs, uh, they have to make sense not only to the stakeholder, but also to the companies that want to move forward and take advantage of it. So, you know, based upon where you are, you know, are you in the position as a board member? Are you a manager? Are you a supervisor? Some of these policies, um, based upon where you are in the chain of, in the, uh, chain of order, may not move any further than just your desk. So you really want to be aware of all the dynamics in your company and be able to articulate the upside of getting involved in this work. Um, this also holds true in occupation. You know, when it comes to DEIJ work, some, some industries get funded more than others um, or vice versa. So just really knowing where you are um, and the occup occupation and professional lines are really critical. And then the other piece, too, is, is, is defining whether or not you're a full-time, part-time, or contract, or volunteer worker. And all this will come to play in a moment. And then the grander order, um, the outermost circle, in terms of the lenses that we wear, uh, we always use the word, it's the isms um, that are available that uh, we can go into uh, dozens of different isms, but the main thing is basically any other form 
of discrimination that aims to maintain separation among any group members. So this goes from such a high degree of uh, opportunities. And, and you'll see when we refer to these different government set aside populations, there's a group within the group within the group. So you really want to know and understand and comprehend where you are um, throughout the supply chain. What we're going to go over from today will hit every industry. So from construction to healthcare, cannabis, clean energy, education, technology, transportation, recreation, food and retail, finance, real estate, and manufacturing. So really, this is not just a um, a uh, pun on words. It's not just, you know, the hit fad for today. It truly is a foundational practice within all layers of, of business. So we're going to go into key terms before we go into some of the policies. Um, so for example, here, diversity. Um, and you're going to hear different variations of what that will be. But for today's conversation, um, we'll use these. Um, diversity is the spectrum of people's identities, cultures, experiences, belief and systems and viewpoints that encompasses the different characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. Equity um, is equal access to power and resources while identifying and eliminating barriers that could prevent access to participating and contributing to the leadership and processes of the organization. Inclusion, uh, respecting and ensuring that all relevant experiences, communities, histories, and people are part of communication plans and solutions to address uh, conservation issues affecting our planet. And justice is the principle that all people are entitled to equal protection of their environment and entitled to participate in and lead on decisions making uh, about environmental justice laws, regulations, policies, and that all people should be empowered to create a better environmental outcome for their communities. So going back, you know, at the foundation of DEIJ, these are real fundamental um, ideologies, and the question will be, well, how does this directly connect to business development? Um, and we'll go into that in the next moment. Um, again, any questions, please let me know as we keep moving forward. So a real key term, um, these are the government set-asides that are put together um, on the federal and local level based upon where you operate your business um, and where you conduct your business in terms of your client base. And so what you'll find these terms pretty frequently, you'll hear MWBE, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, it's any business that is owned, operated, and controlled primarily by a woman or minority group at more than 51% legal ownership of that business entity. Um, that's a really key component. Um, and you'll find that, again, based upon where you conduct your business, uh, these MWBE requirements um, require that spending can range um, between anywhere. And this is based upon... Um, uh, government or private sector aspirational goals. Um, many of those will range between 5% to even as high as 40% of their spend. So based upon what you do professionally, whether you are a product business or a service business, there are government as well as uh, private business um, benchmarks that need to make sure that they show that their money is being spent with minority and women businesses. So you'll hear MWBE come up pretty often. Um, the next category would be SDVOB. Uh, this is known as a service disabled veteran owned business. So for those men or women who, uh, who have served, um, SDVOB funding um, is connected to men and women who have served the country, who have opened up their own business operation and who have been identified as service disabled. And um, again, you'll see in our grid in the moment where that will connect to, but many of the pass-through funding, especially as we look at federal funding um, or even a variety of territory or state spending um, has those requirements. 
Um, all of those are called what we call government set-asides to ensure that there is a um, equitable spread of government funding or private sector funding going through a variety of small business categories. DBE um, and A8, pardon me, are two other categories that you'll hear often, probably more so in Puerto Rico right now in terms of DBEs are a small profit business um, where they are socially and economically considered disadvantaged and owned by at least 51% interest of that disadvantaged population. Now, DBE is a federal designation. That federal designation is connected to pass-through um, federal spends. So when you look at FEMA or look at other, you know, um, Department of Energy or other federal um, categories, they have to spend funds with DBEs. And the same goes true with 8A companies. And the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning all this, because some of it pertains to different territories, um, each opportunity will vary based upon where the funding is coming from. Um, so these are some of the basis of the uh, key terms that we'll be going through um, for today. Two other components um, would be the word disparity study. Uh, disparity study is the um, legal data collection uh, to ensure and document past performance of government contracts. So for example, um, a funded uh, category cannot move forward with a mandated MWBE policy unless they carry out a disparity study. So there are some folks who do manufacturing in Puerto Rico or may do business development um, in Florida, um, but Florida may have a disparity study um, to confirm if they can move forward with an MWBE policy. You just have to be aware of where these policies drop and where they're actually relevant and how it can impact your business. But you cannot have any of these mandated programs unless you complete a disparity study. And that's really uh, critical on that side. Um, the other piece is that all of this has to be documented and it's transparent. So a utilization plan um, basically is the, um, the written proof um, that there was a MWBE or another category of set aside that was on top of a project. Um, this is basically calculated every year. Um, it's part of a fiscal um, package that goes out, um, but utilization plans are very critical in terms of once you get to business, once you get the opportunity, you still have to report out what that will look like. And utilization plans can even dig as deep as asking you, what are the gender categories of who's working on the project? What's the ethnicity uh, in terms of the project? Who's doing blue collar work? Who's doing white collar work? So utilization plans um, are very important for that. So DEIJ policy, what, what, I'm, what I'm going to walk through here for, again, this overarching session for, um, for this week or this month, pardon me, we will have more specific details uh, for the other four sessions that we'll have available for everyone here. Um, but these are just examples of how policies can impact your business to the good. Now, what usually happens, especially when it comes to federal funding, um, expansive development, uh, commercial industrial development projects tend to be incentivized within disadvantaged communities um, across a variety of different uh, regions and territories um, by way of tax benefits, zoning provisions, and government funding. Um, and this is a big deal because often, you know, these monies that come from by way of government, at least, for example, they don't automatically go into the communities that are already doing very, very well. Um, where we're trying to educate folks is making sure that local residents and small businesses that happen to be in these communities that are um, deemed as disadvantaged have an equitable seat at the table um, so that they can um, take advantage of the opportunities through all this funding. So here's a great example of a, of a policy that is moving um, small business and these policies are being pushed um, all throughout um, well, so many different territories. 
So this right here is an example of a clean energy act. Um, this is by way of the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, basically, the overall um, goal of this act, the CLCPA, is to eliminate 100% of climate pollution caused by humans, uh, calling for an 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which is really around the corner, um, and hit an additional or you know midway target by 40% by 2030, which is really not a lot of time um, away. Um, but when you look at this policy even deeper, you'll see that it states that the CLCPA instructs um, all, and this is, remember, this is a New York example, um, instructs all New York state agencies, authorities, and entities to invest and direct available and relevant programmatic resources to achieve their goal, but they must have 40% of those financial benefits in disadvantaged communities. So you may be saying to yourself right now, well, how does that impact you? Well, again, based upon your business model, where you conduct business, where you advise, uh, could be a combination of some of your people may work in Puerto Rico, some of them may work in the state, whatever it may be, these policies will actually absolutely impact you in terms of how you can hire, how you can gain additional business and your participation uh, in these different markets. So this policy at 40% disadvantage leans towards communities that historically don't have a voice. And this is an opportunity to do authentic um, and impactful business development while impacting these communities the right way. So here's a great example of how policy is connected to DEIJ. And just to give you an idea in terms of how the monies for this uh, are connected, um, just about three weeks ago, there was a, a giant, huge lease um, for offshore wind that took place right between New York and New Jersey. But if you take a look at the numbers of all these developers that came in and what they spent in terms of securing their lease, um, this tells us that this multi-billion dollar endeavor at $4.37 billion with a B, all of these agencies have to comply with this policy, which has a substantial disadvantaged community component to it. So see how, again, the funding connects back to the policy, which connects back to DEIJ. In addition to being investments into those communities, you also need to also have a number of certified firms as part of the work together. Here's another policy. Um, again, uh, forgive me, this is a, another New York one. Uh, you'll have more specific ones for the series we have next month. But for this deal here, cannabis is, le is being legalized all throughout um, a variety of different territories. But if you're a manufacturer, um, based upon where you are, it, it may have nothing to do with the actual leaf, but there are other wraparound services ranging from packaging and lighting and everything in between to still participate. But when you look at the policies here, they are requiring 50% of licenses must go to social and economic equity applicants. Um, that by definition is women, minorities, veterans, um, in some case, um, scenario with special needs populations. Um, this is where the policies will, will come and hit. And this 50% license fee directly has impacted um, this industry. And this is what we call a social equity policy. The other piece too, in terms of the industry is that what we find is that, well, what happens in this category, taxes. So for this particular policy, um, they're ensuring that the taxes collected from the sale of legal cannabis, 40% um, of it has to go towards education, 40% has to go towards community grant reinvestment fund, and 20% has to go to drug treatment and public education fund. So again, this entire industry is being baked, no pun intended, with DEIJ policy, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. So the question should be, how can your company align with it how can your company take advantage of these opportunities? So on the government side, we mentioned before, and, and, and hopefully you uh, 
don't mind my colorful triangle graph here. So based upon where you are, on top of that, that pyramid should be the taxpayer, okay? Now on the federal level, and again, this goes right down to your territory as well, on the federal level, these categories are directly connected to federal spending. Um, so 8A, 5% of the federal spend has to go with an 8A certified uh, business. 3% has to be hub zone certified. 5% has to be woman owned small business. And 3% of the federal budget has to be spent with a service disabled veteran owned business. So this is really an area that's wide open. Um, so if you happen to fit these categories, whether you're a veteran, a woman, if you're within certain these populations, you are eligible, pending some other qualifications, to be able to compete. You know, and five percent, you know, three percent may not seem like a lot compared to a ten dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill. But when you have a multi-billion um, dollar budget coming from the federal government, three percent, five percent can go an incredibly long way. Um, so again, these are mandated spend downs. Okay. That are here for everybody. And if you are not a diverse firm or if you are not certified, then you can work with okay. firms that are certified uh, to help you be able to move um, your procurement efforts. Again, based upon where you're doing business, internationally, domestically, whatever it may be, these will range um, on the local state level. Uh, again, I mentioned it as low as 5%, as high as 30, 40%. So this will be this will vary based upon where you are. And again, mentioned here, it varies. Right. Are there any questions so far? All right, no problem. All right, we'll keep going. So DEIJ business development um, for on the corporate side. So what does that look like for everyone here? Now, we spoke up briefly about the government side, but the reality of it is corporations have uh, made substantial investments and promises and commitments um, to meet the needs of their clients, of their consumer, of their employees. So you're going to hear this term, it's a corporate social responsibility, or the term hyphenated is um, CSR. And basically, corporate social responsibility is also known as CSR, is the concept that a business has a responsibility to do good. CSR means that a company should self-regulate uh, its actions and be socially accountable to its customers, stakeholders, and the world at large. Many CSR policies revolve around environmental responsibility, ethical responsibility, philanthropic responsibility and economic responsibility. Um, so to give you some high level uh, ideologies and environmental responsibility could be, for example, moving towards uh, a renewable, cleaner energy grid. It could be we are reducing the amount of, of um, garbage and trash and we are only using recyclable bags. Environmental responsibility could be something as easy as putting together uh, a timer in the grocery store that goes off if no one's nearby, you know, for more than a minute and the lights turn off uh, temporarily. Um, there's a million different ways that you can look at environmental responsibility, um, even from farm to table. Um, but that's that's one uh, one area in terms of environmental responsibility. Um, ethical responsibility could range everything from um, transparency clauses for a company. Uh, they could be self um, publishing uh, their deliverables in terms of what they do in, in the community. They can be uh, transparent about where they invest in the community. Um, gosh, there's so many different policies that can go into play. Philanthropic is where they reinvest their money. So often you'll see places give out big checks of any type and they'll have them hoisted in the front lobby or shared online or on social. Um, most companies plan for their philanthropic giving each year. Um, and part of the, their uh, a comprehensive CSR program, um, they will align their philanthropic given with the core functions of their business. Um, and this comes up very much, very often. So 
as a business, you know, are you, do you have these policies yourself? And as a business, are you aligning with your corporate partners to be able to help them meet these great goals? The last part is economic responsibility. So economic responsibility would be, you know, are you using local organizations to help source your supply chain? You know, are you making these investments and tapping into the local community? Um, a company could be spending $50 million a year. The question should be, well, how much of that is being spent locally in the zip code that they're based out of? So um, economic responsibility, you'll see a lot of diversity supplier, uh, part of the supplier diversity programs come out of that and local um, reinvestment. And some of the benefits, again, for your own company and also for some of the companies in your market that you're looking to work with, you know, uh, when a business commits social responsibility practices, it's positive impact to its employees, satisfaction and retention. And as many, if not all of you are fully aware, we are going through um, globally um, a talent shortage. So everything that you can do to help address that, um, the better. Um, a CSR program also increases consumer trust and public respect as well. Um, lastly, it is a ripple effect of good. When you do good, you get good, and good continues to be amplified. Um, and most companies that have an aggressive CSR program are just as aggressive to ensure um, that employee retention is high. Uh, they're just more likely to ensure that their customer satisfaction is high. So there is a high degree of sophistication needed um, for any company that wants to participate in a CSR program. Now on the corporate side, there are some larger organizations that serve as a third party certification agent. Um, so what you can do is just come off the street and say, hi, I'm a woman owned business or hi, I'm a minority owned business or hello, I'm a veteran owned business. All of that must be vetted and certified to ensure the integrity of these programs. Um, and most of the time, these certifications will take place anywhere between two to six months based upon you know, where you are. Um, and some may even take a year if it's a more on the government side. It really all depends. But there are two organizations here that there are chapters that this allows you to navigate uh, and work within the corporate side. Um, one of which, which we are, is the National Minority Supplier Development Council. Uh, there's actually a chapter in Puerto Rico as well, but this is a national international agency. So you'll find chapters all throughout. And then you'll see woman owned as well in terms of being a woman certified business enterprise. So this is all for the corporate side. And if you have any questions, you can let me know directly. Company-wise, um, many of the top companies throughout the world have these programs. If you would like to sell into their programs or be a part of anything they're doing, um, you simply have to sign up in terms of one of their supply chain portals. And more importantly, you want to make sure that you're certified because that will help uh, help you leverage other opportunities in terms of where their spending will actually be. So again, these are just a, a short example, but there's plenty of more companies, big and small, that do have corporate DEIJ programs that can benefit your business. So low level, again, you know, today was meant to be just a brief overview. Um, question number one, am I eligible to be certified? So if you are a woman-owned business, again, remember the parameters, you must have over 51% ownership. Are you a woman-owned business? Are you a minority-owned business? Are you veteran? Um, again, there are special needs categories too, which we'll go through in our next um, session. Uh, but if you happen to fall into any of them, even small business, um, I'd recommend getting certified. You know, there's paperwork needed like anything else, but it does open up some other opportunity. Um, based upon the work that you do, I did mention government for a while, but does your team, does your business have an individual or a team actively addressing procurement opportunities? So what ends up happening, these opportunities just don't fall in your lap and here's a check for X amount of money. You do have to apply for it. So the companies that do it best are the companies that actually make the investment and the time or contract out a professional team 
to be able to conduct the procurement for you. Um, again, based upon who you are, some people are B2B, business to business, some people are B2C, business to consumer. In other case scenarios, people are also business to B2G, uh, business to government. So again, you really want, if you want to activate these opportunities, you want to be able to um, have the right personnel address them for you. And then last but not least would be, does your company have an intentional or measurable DEIJ strategy? Um, what you always want to do is be ahead of it. You don't want to react to the funding or react to the opportunities. Um, this holds especially true for some of our manufacturing partners. Uh, we find that the best um, results are when they already have the program in place to start. Because when these opportunities come, some of them need you to turn it around in two weeks. You'll be lucky in some cases if it's 30 days. Um, so you really want to make sure that you have your strategy. Again, from a business development standpoint, um, easy practices such as your marketing material. Does your marketing material reflect a cross-section of the community that you're trying to reach? Yeah, it seems like a very basic um, conversation to have, but you would be surprised to see how many companies misalign their public affairs, their marketing communications, because it does not match with the communities that they're serving. Um, are you empowering all levels of per, uh, individual in your company to be able to help these initiatives? You know, so in terms of giving people additional work or giving them a, a an area to grow in, this is a great place to engage folks. So in terms of creating your own corporate social responsibility program or your supplier diversity program, um, these are great engagement tools to get your employees to uh, stay with you. Uh, and also to recruit as well. So that's all, all I had for today for part one um, of our five part series. This is just an overview, uh, but the information is relevant for any business owner, um, any local stakeholder, and the funding is here. And that's the funny part about all the funding is here today. So if this is not your your main cup of tea. Um, we can help assist you or there are plenty of other organizations that uh, would be happy to um, assist you along the way. Now, my information is up on the screen right now, but I'll open it up here for any questions that we may have. Thanks, Glenn. That was amazing. Really, really informative. Um, I do have a, a question, actually. Uh, the you mentioned something that really struck, you know, finding someone or identifying people that are going to help, right? In terms of, you know, finding some of these opportunities, vetting these opportunities. When you're starting out in a small business, as you know, typically most of us are wearing multiple hats. Is there a specific um, budget or something that you would recommend that we allot if, for instance, we are looking to uh, find a third party to actually help identify some of these opportunities for us? So you, you asked a great question. So I'm, I believe teaming is such a great approach. So you may have another peer um, who's like-minded with you and it may be an opportunity to pool resources together. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, some of these applications re, uh, require multiple solutions. So based upon what you're doing, uh, um, I'll try to give you a good example. Um, uh, there may be funding available for a multi-year um, safety product pro. I, I'm making a safety program. Well, you're going to need a project manager. You're going to need a sign company. You're going to need a host site. Could be a hotel for training. You're going to need a printer, you know, for material. You're going to need a translator based on where it's located, and you may need some telecommunication support. So one application could actually end up providing opportunities for, for eight or 10 different businesses. So I say in terms of budgets, you, you have to team. Um, and I've said this all the time, professional writers um, are often underrated, and they're single-handedly the most important piece in this whole question, uh, this whole solution because they actually have to write this for you. So it, it takes a little bit of science and a little bit of art. So to answer your question again, I would pool together um, so that you can have the right people do this work for you. 
Awesome. Thank you, Glenn. And you mentioned that there was obviously the, the timing of, you know, and that the certification, right, is required. You can't just walk into a business and say, I'm a woman owned, uh, you know, minority owned business or veteran owned business. So um, did you say that takes anywhere from six months to a year? And can you yeah, elaborate it, it, on it, why it, it takes it, that long? Yeah. So think about it. This, this opportunity opens you up to millions of dollars of, of funding opportunities. So there are, unfortunately, people out there who are trying to take advantage of this competitive edge. Um, so you, you, want, you want to do diligence to make sure you are saying who you are. Um, a big reason why it takes so long as well is that there are a lot of people also putting together fronts. So you may not necessarily really be the actual ownership as being a woman or minority or veteran um, but there may be somebody behind you pushing it through. The, the vetting process does exactly that. It vets out any types of conflict of interest that would compromise the process for you. Um, so it does take time. You know, it, it, it gets to the point where they ask you to get a notary from your own parents uh, to, to state what you are culturally. Um, and if you don't, if your parents aren't with us, you know, there are other ways to verify too. But um that's the reason why it takes a while um but once you get there you, you'll be happy awesome awesome i great job this is gonna be a, an amazing a series this is again one of five everybody i am uh checking the chat just to make sure there aren't any other questions um I definitely want to just thank you so much, Glenn, for your time. Again, my name is Veronica Montalvo. I am an ambassador for the NPR Chamber of Commerce. I'm also an entrepreneur uh, with several, several, several projects here on the island um, and in the States. And I'm, you know, again, very, very grateful for you being a member of uh, the National Puerto Rican Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is um, like incredibly important and valuable information that we should be disseminating. So super proud to be part of this. Thank you so much, Glenn. No, it's, it's an honor to be a member. You guys have been fantastic. And, and for everyone who's on the call, this is a great chamber who, who actively is out there advocating and, and supporting small business and recognizing large businesses. So um, we're, we're proud to be a part of this series with you and um, look forward to um, helping as many businesses, especially now with so much infrastructure funding going down to everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not never a better time. Thank you so much for your efforts, Glenn. Thank you so much. See you all next session. Thank you. Again, be sure to follow up. Make sure uh, you have access to, if you're subscribed, you're receiving updates for the upcoming webinars and also have access to this recording if you missed any part of it. Thank you again for participating. This is Veronica with the NPR Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate you. We wish you continued success. See you the next time.